and we can ev even look at what happens as you don't use all of the cores on a node, or if you pretended, well, if we had more GPUs or four GPUs, and we see, well, there's sort of a sweet spot as you go from a t it, at about a two to one ratio. So going from one CPU per core to two CPUs per core, or one core per GPU to two cores per GPU gets you a substantial performance increase. If you follow these curves, four, four CPUs down to eight CPUs, it gets faster. Going all the way to four CPUs per core, or four cores per GPU, doesn't give you a substantial benefit. So we at least want two cores per GPU. And that exact ratio is going to depend on how many cores there are, how many GPUs, because there's a balance, and it also depends on what options are actually being used. Because there is special code that is you know, used for specialized features such as um, the grid-based forces in AMD, not GPU accelerated, but it's actually, you know, surprise, it's expensive, not so much that it drastically slows down a CPU-based simulation, but it can become a bottleneck for, CPU, for a GPU accelerated simulation. Okay, so in an ideal world, we have no ideal sharing. Basically, you know, the GPU's life is receive positions, calculate one set of forces, send those back, calculate a second set of forces, send those back. This is what we want to happen. We've got two clients. They both send their positions as soon as they're ready. We want some sense of priority. So you calculate a set of forces, transmit those back, then since any remote force is higher priority than any local force, we do client two's forces, send those forces back, and then we start working on the local forces. So this separation of doing all the remote forces ahead of the local forces, regardless of clients, is what we really want to see. This is what I was afraid to happen, was that you know, client one would submit, you know, it would stuck send, send, you know, four different commands, transmit my positions, do the remote forces, send those back, and it would be basically whoever got in the queue first got out of the queue first on the GPU, and then client two would be delayed. So we would have <clears throat> basically these local forces coming ahead of these remote forces. When we actually did some experiments, it was completely different because we didn't even get that. What appeared to be happening was, okay, client one gets its remote forces, and then, you know, the remote forces for client two seem to be delayed until after the local force for client one, and then finally at the end we get all the local forces at once. So not, not efficient at all because we don't get any stagger and overlap stuff. I stared at this for a while and I finally realized what was happening is that those force calculations are not one kernel invocation. So they're not atomic as far as the GPU is concerned because we're calculating forces and then we are summing the forces that are calculated by different blocks into a single array is breaking it up into two kernels. So if you think of the force transmission as a separate kernel, okay, we're running you know two kernels from client one, then we're switching to client two, then client one, then client two, maybe a little more down here. It's sort of random, there's some sort of fairness going on, but it's not what we want. So whether whether you know the CUDA operating system switches to have a better management system for this or not, we've got a couple options for dealing with this. What we've decided to do is sort of coordinate on our side. Uh, so option one is, well, if we just have the different clients for the GPU coordinate among themselves, hopefully you know, we can not submit client two's work until client one finishes. So we simply pass a token between the different processors. And if you do that, it works pretty well. So we're getting this nice staggered effect. So this is a four to one ratio of cores to GPUs. And as you can see, it works pretty well. We've got remote calculation happening, those get returned, it happens and then the local calculation happens and we get these results back. The problem, first of all, is that this takes longer because the GPU, there's a lag between firing off the GPU for the different stages. But the nice thing is if you look at this, 
you know, the GPU is only unused basically between what the last four, you know, the forces showing up here, so the end of this red to the end of this. So basically, this is how much time, yeah, there it is. Most of the time, the GPU is actually being used, even though, you know, we have overlap with everything. So, this works pretty well, but there's this lag. The other problem with passing this token around is that this is a cutoff simulation. When we turn on PME, the pattern is still there, but it's broken up by the particle mesh AWOL calculation. So, you know, we calculate our forces, and then we have to do gridding of the charges, then we have different stages of the FFT coming through, so this stretches the amount of time that the GPU is actually being met, used. So you can see, you know, here we use it here, then it's idle, we use it here, idle some more. So this is not a good solution. So what the ultimate solution is going to be is that we're going to have one process maximum per GPU. We could have two GPUs per process, but we'll probably split it up a little bit. One GPU per process, run one thread per core, which NAMD is capable of, um, and we're going to have to funnel all the CUDA calls through a single stream running on a single thread, because you can't, the CUDA interface is not thread safe, you can't call the same stream from you can't call the same interface from different threads. Um, so this is what we're going to have to do. Okay. So our plans, there are a lot of these things. Okay. So looking forward, we've got you know, a few things that we want to do. Get the hidden thing up. So we have uh, production features in the 2.7, beta 2, and beta 3 releases that have been out. Uh, PME works, the 1.4 exclusions work. We have constant pressure simulation for uh, isotropic systems. We're not reporting the full pressure tensor yet. And uh, the force accuracy is improved over previous versions. Um, we have some performance enhancements in progress. So we're working on a version of Paralysts, which roughly doubles uh, performance using 16 atom blocks based Paralysts. So rather than atom to atom, we're simply switching off which chunks of atoms that we're loading. And looking forward, we're targeting uh, the Fermi architecture for future kernel designs, and we're also targeting the new Fermi-based clusters, which are going in at... Uh, Oak Ridge, and hopefully at NCSA, um, those will be on the order of 500 GPUs per cluster, which is pretty decent, but it's still a small fraction of the total teragrid uh, computation ability, and finally, um, dynamic load balancing. So Keeneland is uh, Fermi's with uh, Ockrams, or? No, Keeneland is um, Fermi Nehalem. So I think I think everyone is pretty much going with um, a new HP server that's coming out with the Halo processors, and I'm not sure they're either using with it. I think they're 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 actually going for within the case GPUs to increase connectivity. You mean Opry brought a non tray vendor? Oh yeah, yeah. For this they did. And then, I know Cray is talking about putting Fermi's into their architecture as well in the next generation of Cray XT3s, but so that'll be, that'll be an option. And, you know, it, there's sort of a chicken and egg problem, too, because if you go to the Department of Energy and the National Science Foundation with a proposal for a big GPU machine, what they ask is not, what great new science can we do? They ask, so, how much work can we move off of the other machines onto this? to relieve that overcrowding. And, you know, if you're doing things that run really well in the GPU and you're not writing new code that's not GPU accelerated, then that works pretty well. But if you're doing experimental features and various other things, I think we estimated we could move maybe 60% of our work onto a GPU accelerated cluster at this time.
just because we don't have the time to port every single feature yet. Even 60% is pretty ambitious. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> well, it's not ambitious. It, we could do it because we those people don't need the features that aren't on the GPU yet. So. Yeah. So some of it works, but if you're doing I mean, the other guys could use it too. It just wouldn't accelerate it as much. So, if you're looking forward, um, I'd say that CUDA today is great and has been, you know, for several years now, great for single GPU acceleration, which is what most people need. Uh, you know, if you're looking at something that's going to be used by a large number of people like VMD, the beauty with VMD is everyone who runs VMD has some type of GPU, and if they're doing anything aggressive with it, they're going to have, you know, a pretty decent GPU in that machine, so you can use that for computation and analysis jobs pretty regularly, and I think we've been recommending NVIDIA hardware just for stability reasons for probably a decade now. So. Yeah, yeah, especially for Linux, they, they definitely have the better drivers. Yeah. And if you have enough work, so if you've got something that's going to run for a couple of seconds, you can certainly spin up multiple GPUs to keep track of that, as long as you've got enough parallelism for those. Um, but, again, it's a smaller number of people that are going to be able to take advantage of that. It's a research code that only you, you are using. There's the balance between do I want to do the work to use multiple GPUs and get results back faster, or do I just run independent jobs that use each GPU? So that's you know, the next step up. and. We are still, you know, pushing improvements in CUDA for things like assigning which process can use which GPU in a controlled manner by the operating system, having multiple processes share the GPU in a controlled manner, so you have a guaranteed quality of service to, for example, you know, the, the renderer versus computation, and finally getting more fine-grained parallelism and finer-grained interaction between the GPU and the CPU onto there. And uh, the final note is moving data between GPUs. Uh, you may have heard there are there's a new um, NVIDIA has been working with one of the InfiniBand vendors to enable faster transfers for GPU accelerated clusters. So when you want to move data from one a GPU on one machine or a GPU on another machine, currently, you know, ideally. You go straight from the GPU to the InfiniBand card, to the other InfiniBand card, into GPU memory. That's not supported yet. What they do support now is you can go from GPU memory to main memory, to the InfiniBand card, to main memory on the other processor, and then to GPU memory on the other processor. So you only have one, two, three, four, five copies rather than one copy. Well, four copies. One, two, three. You have four copies. <coughs> right? Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. However you count it, it's a lot. It's more than more than more than none. And the old way that you had to do it was that if you were trying to use page locked memory on the host for the InfiniBand transfers and for the GPU data transfers, that memory couldn't be shared by both the GPU and the infinite.